So let, let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be present with those who take counsel in the vestry for the renewal and mission of your church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory, and guide us to perceive what is right, and grant us both courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So that's a prayer for uh, church conventions and meetings, and it's uh, the one most appropriate for uh, those of you that gather in vestries uh, to do uh, the work of the church. And notice what it says. It says to take counsel um, for the renewal and the mission of the church. Um, renewal and mission of the church, a very broad and very ministry-oriented uh, focus. Um, and uh, and the, the prayer is to sort of seek God first, God's honor and glory first, and to be guided as to what's right, and to have courage to pursue it, grace to do it. I know many of you in becoming vestry members um, are probably the last ones to sort of um, step uh, back when everybody's asked to go come forward and volunteer, um, and you'll just slow off the mark or you were the last one entering the room um, that the rector managed to get a hold of. Um, some of you may you know, really look forward to being a vestry member, and I would encourage you to look forward to being a vestry member uh, because you are involved in the leadership of the mission and ministry of the church. Um, it's not just about buildings and grounds and finances and how can we survive, it's about and nurturing and nourishing uh, the mission of the of the congregation, and also uh, being part of that, uh, bringing uh, into being the various uh, callings of God in people's lives, as all of you as members of the baptized body of Christ work towards uh, God's kingdom. So that to me is the, is the primary purpose and focus of the vestry. And we're here today to sort of look at um, sort of nuts and bolts, and certainly some of the canons and, and what are the requirements in that respect. But I want to lead off uh, by just encouraging uh, this vision of, of, uh, of spiritual work, that you're being called to spiritual work, uh, for which um, what will be required of you is spiritual preparation. And I was fortunate um, as a curate to land in a congregation where the rector was doing a, a, a ministry of a, a, do, a doctorate in ministry on vestry preparation. And he particularly focused on um, how do they develop themselves as a community of, of leaders that first and foremost see their focus being this, this mission of God. And uh, he, he came across, across the idea that that the, the key thing is to know each other across the table as children of God, so that you get to know each other's faith stories. You get to know why you're there and how you got there into the church in the first place and how God has moved and touched the life. And so he would send, he would, um, he, he would only receive candidates for, for vestry if they were willing to commit to say early February uh, going away with the rest of the vestry and himself and the church the clergy staff to do a retreat. And uh, they would be Friday night through Sunday and the church body itself meeting on Sunday would be in the hands of a supply priest. Um, and, um, and all of the leaders would be away. And they use that time, that extended time, um, as to primarily focus on telling that faith story. And he would ask questions like, what, when did Jesus become more than a word to you? Um, uh, and, and other kinds of questions that would bring out of the person a, a faith story. Um, and of course, you know, many of us, even clergy, uh, when I've done something like this with clergy, I've discovered that they haven't told their faith story to anybody except when they were going through the commission or ministry. I mean, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's really quite quite surprising that we don't often share that. Maybe we're just modest, maybe we're humble, but it's, it's encouraging to share each other's faith story. 
So we spent Friday night and most of Saturday morning on these retreats uh, doing this. And I carried this practice over to um, my own parish in, uh, in St. Barnabas in Eagle Rock. Um, and, you know, it's after we've told the faith stories but then we kind of moved to well, what's happening, what happened last year, and where is God leading us today? And one of the things that we discovered because of this particular personal approach was we also realized that the gifts of God were among us for whatever needed to be done that year in ministry. Um, and we spent some time trying to discern what those gifts were and learning how to sort of um, hand over to each other when we um, when certain things had to be needed to be done. Um, we knew, for example, in our parish that a certain member of our parish was so gifted in summarizing things that when it came to the end of near the end of the retreat, and we needed to sort of write out what we'd all been doing, we just handed it over to her, and she did a brilliant job of of focusing us for the few things that we were to do primarily that year. So sometimes the gifts are not there that might want to, you know, we may want to, you go, go, what I'm trying to say is going to the direction, go in the direction of the of the vestry, go in the direction of ministry of the gifts that are in that room for that year. And let, let that be sort of evidence to you of God, God's guidance and God giving that grace to accomplish what we want to do. So that's what I want to sort of primarily um, emphasize in my opening chat today. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, on a monthly basis to, to sort of be willing to give 10, 15 minutes of, of that precious vestry time, uh, nevertheless, to continue to nurture um, that time, that, that, that spiritual life among the community, to pray for one another, to share things that might be going on in your lives, and just continue to relate to each other as children of God. Um, and I think that helps diminish a lot of the power dynamics. It helps to uh, helps during conflict to see a person wider and broader than just conflicting opinions themselves. And, and certainly is something that models mutual ministry to the whole of the, of the parish. Um, so I think that's what I want to, to share in, in, in my time with you right now, before we, we may at the end of the time get on with questions, but that's what I would like to share. Thank you. I want to hand over to Kathleen, who's going to go into the canons and the, some of the nuts and bolts of day-to-day um, -day life as a, uh, in the vestry. Um, she may even have some things to tell me that uh, make it not quite appear so easy to gather people for or retreats, but we'll, we'll see what she has to say. Well, I, I'm Kathleen Milligan. I'm currently the uh, rector at St. Stephen's in Newton, and I'm coming up to 35 years uh, of ministry in the Episcopal Church and in Iowa. I've served with a number of bishops' committees and vestries over the years, and um, I would have to reiterate that the vestry retreat is a good idea, and I have to say also that I came to this rather late. We did retreats in every parish I was in, but um, they were really pretty nuts and bolts goal setting retreats until much later in my ministry when I realized that it was important to take the time to do the, the work of building community and relationship around a faith story, not only our own personal stories, but to get at the faith story of the congregation. How did it start? What were the strengths and the weaknesses of the parish over the years? Where were the conflicts and what were the resolutions of all of those things? Because congregations and communities have faith stories of their own and inviting new people into those faith stories is a really um, invigorating, reinvigorating way to, to, um, to grow the story and the sense of the congregation and its ministry for today. Um, the vestry is, uh, in many ways, a legal entity, well, it is a legal entity that functions uh, to hold in trust, uh, or hold some trust for the, the resources of the parish to take care of uh, the fabric of the building, to take care of the financial well-being of the congregation. 
they are also really entrusted with the goal and task of raising the money, of taking seriously the whole notion of stewardship and being the ones, I mean, the preacher may be the teacher and the preacher of stewardship, but the people who model that, live that, take care of that, um, see that as their responsibility to, to work, to build the stewardship life of the parish. The vestry is intimately related to that and seeing it as a part of the broader ministry of the church. The canons of the general Episcopal church mention the vestry in various places, but largely the work of the vestry is spelled out in title three, canon nine, the ministry canons, title three, section nine, the ministry canons that talk a great deal about the things that the vestries can do and not do. In our own diocesan canons, canons 24 through 27, I believe, um, are the ones that particularly refer to the vestry. 23 sets up the parameters of the annual meeting where vestry members are elected. And it says that, that vestry members are chosen from among the communicants in good standing, uh, which basically means people who are adults over 16 years old. They um, have been in attendance on the church services on a regular basis. The canons actually state three times in a given year, but, um, but really you would ideally find people who are much more committed than that and who for the previous three months have supported the parish in financial ways. And that means traceable. I mean, you can throw money into the communion, into the offering plate every week and not be considered to have met that unless that somebody can say that this person gave this amount of money on this date. So the right of challenge at, vestry, at annual meetings is possible. People can say, well, you can't vote because we, we don't. And certainly if you're running for, tre running for the vestry, there is a right of challenge at the vestry meetings. If somebody thinks that a person hasn't done it, they can actually challenge that. So um, that's important to know, even though many vestries probably say, this is a warm body who's willing to do this. Um, it's important that to know that these people have some commitment to the congregation as a whole and on a longer term basis. Um, Canon 24 gets at how vestries are set up at the beginning when a parish is organized and how you set up the vestry because it's possible to have anywhere from six to 15 members and you kind of can choose what makes sense for your congregation. And this can be changed over the course of time too. And 20, Canon 24 tells how that is organized um, how vestry members will rotate on and off so that you don't all ever have an all new vestry, except when you start out. Um, and so congregations make choices about that and they may choose to, to move from one level to another, depending on circumstances. Uh, Canon 25 is where the heart of the, the vestry duties are outlined. Um, and it's, um, you can find the canons for the, the diocese, by the way, if you go to the diocesan website, look under the resources tab for constitution and canons, which also gives you the rules of order for convention and uh, a description of the hair ballot. And you can choose one of those four, click on it. You click on canons, you can uh, read all of the canons of the diocese, interesting reading. Um, but the canon 25 outlines the vestry obligations as the vestry is urged to cooperate with the rector in promoting the spiritual welfare of the parish and shall aid the rector in the initiation, conduct and development of the program of the church, both within and without the parish. The vestry shall accept responsibility for the mission of the church in the community, the diocese, the nation and the world, and shall be the means by which the general church and the diocese communicate with the parish. The vestry shall represent the parish in its relationships with the, rec the rector. The vestry shall serve as a council of advice for the rector upon his or her request, or whenever in the judgment of both wardens, there are matters that should be brought to the rector's attention. The vestry shall encourage fit men and women to enter the specialized ministries of the church. Uh, the vestry shall be the agents and legal representatives of the parish in all matters concerning its corporate property. The vestry shall supervise the care and maintenance of the buildings, furnishing and other uh, properties of the parish, shall be responsible for the proper care of the finances of the parish, shall present a complete statement of the financial condition of the parish to each annual parish meeting, 
The vestry shall make arrangements for the support of the rector and in the event of death, resignation or removal to notify the bishop without delay and to supply the rector's place as soon as possible in accordance with the canons of the Episcopal Church related thereto. And the vestry shall be responsible for such other duties as enumerated in Canon 26 of these canons. Okay. So let's look at these one at a time and flesh them out a little bit. Vestry is urged to cooperate with the rector in promoting the spiritual welfare of the parish and shall aid the rector in the initiation, conduct and development of the program of the church, both within and without the parish. This does get at what the Bishop was talking about in terms of the importance of a good vestry retreat and using it as a time to build a kind of a family, a, a, a corporate rela a relationship that is grounded in a common spiritual story uh, and the telling of the stories that the individuals bring to that along with their gifts. Uh, the, the annual retreat is often best held offsite and often with an outside leader, um, bringing in someone else just to be a different voice and to look at what's there and be able to observe things that people who are familiar with each other may not see in quite the same way. So I would encourage you to look at doing that. Um, conduct and development of the program of the church, both within and without the parish. Goal setting can be a particularly uh, important aspect of a parish retreat, or it may be done at another time. If you want to give a parish retreat over to a, a, a building of spiritual life for the, for the vestry, that's good. But some time needs to be set each year in looking at what has been done, what has been accomplished in the past year, what still needs to be done, what is working outside in the community. Um, some people have engaged in developing long range goals, uh, long range planning, um, and that can be a very good thing to do, but circumstances change quite rapidly and the congregation you start out with in the beginning of a five year plan may not be the people who are there three or four years in or there may be new people or there may be new things going on in the community. So even if you've got a five year plan, looking at it from time to time and making sure that, that it is still where you are, where you need to be, um, can be very good. One way of using the goal setting is to, again, as the Bishop said, look at who's there. Look at who is around the table. Look at what gifts are there. Um, begin to look at, in terms of the two or three things that are most important right now, are most alive right now. And, and it can be a useful thing to use those goals as a means of developing the the rationale, uh, the subject matter for an annual evaluation, not only of the clergy in the parish, but also of the uh, congregation and the vestry itself. As we begin to flesh out our goals, um, to list the, the various tasks, the various steps in achieving the goal and assign, is this a vestry responsibility? Is this a rector's responsibility? Is this something we want to ask a, a commission on education to take care of or a commission on stewardship to, to be involved in and to outline all of that so that when it comes time to do the annual review, you have a basis already agreed upon at the beginning. Um, rather than trying to do just a scattershot uh, evaluation each year, there are resources for such mutual ministry evaluations available, um, but you can often construct your own just by putting together your, your, your planning and goals for the year in a way that it lends itself to that. So I encourage you to look at the um, developing the life and mission and ministry of the church as an ongoing part of the vestry's work from year to year. Second, the vestry shall accept responsibility for the mission of the church in the community, the diocese, the nation, and the world, and shall be the means by which the general church and the diocese communicate with the parish. It's important for the vestry to have a, a, a recognition of what's outside the doors. It's, it's very easy for vestries um, to focus on the, so to such an extent on the, the buildings and the finances and um, in some years, the relationship with the, vec the rector that um, it's hard to see what's outside the door and to see the mission field that is really out there, the ways in which members of the community and of the parish are already involved in ministry and ways in which the, the vestry can support uh, those ministries that the parishioners are doing. And, um, and find a way to follow along with where the energy is in the, in the parish and to support that. Uh, and then the communication function 
cannot be overstated. Um, I found out just by the way, just that people did not know that this meeting was happening. Um, and it's been in publications, it's been uh, talked about from pulpits, I'm sure, but you just can, it seems like you can never over communicate. So the vestry can be constantly evaluating its own system for communicating among vestry members, but in the parish as well, and take that, that responsibility quite seriously. The diocese and the, and the general church increasingly are, are making all kinds of things available to people um, in virtual formats. And uh, to be able to know that that's going on, vestries can, can be a, a major part in doing that. Section three, the vestry shall represent the parish in its relations with the rector. Um, of course, initially in the call process, rec the vestries are very much involved, even if the search committee has done a lot of the work of bringing candidates in, it is the vestry's final responsibility. The vestry does need to be involved in an ongoing uh, evaluation of the work of the parish and vestry together, the, the priest and vestry together. Um, and of course, the vestry shall be um, intending to help support the rector uh, in her or his ministry uh, and to be there to support the needs of the family of the priest as well. Um, shall serve as a counsel of advice for the rector upon his or her request or wherever in the judgment of both wardens there are matters that should be brought to the rector's attention. And this means if there begins to be some sense of discomfort with the way things are going or concern about a, a rector's um, attitudes or actions, uh, the earlier that that is talked about openly by the wardens uh, with the, with the uh, the rector or priest, the better, the, the more likely things can be resolved before things heat up. So take that responsibility quite seriously. Section five, the vestry shall encourage fit men and women to enter the specialized ministries of the church. The congregation and the vestry in particular are charged with raising up people who can, might be considered for ordination or certainly for other um, licensed ministries in the church. Um, we really are to be committees of discernment. And in fact, no one in the Episcopal Church is ordained without ongoing vestry support at every level. When they are nominated uh, to the bishop as for postulancy, that nomination needs to be signed by the vestry having voted with a two thirds majority um, to move that person into to the bishop's purview as a postulant. Again, when the made, person is made a candidate for ordination, which comes sometimes about halfway through the preparation, the vestry votes again. And then when the person is moved to ordination, the vestry votes again. So you really are integral to that whole process of discerning who is um, called to and, and gifted for this ministry. Um, Discernment committees are also formed in congregations to look at this, but even after the discernment committee has made its report, the vestry has final say in that. Um, the vestry shall be the agents and legal representatives of, of the parish in all matters concerning its corporate property. It will be the vestry's responsibility to uh, deal with the finances, to make arrangements for the property maintenance and upkeep, to sign contracts, um, on behalf of the parish for the work to be done. It also needs to be said at this point that there are some restrictions on that. The vestry, oops, the vestry cannot um, sell the property, cannot uh, encumber the property by taking a loan on it, cannot make major, ma major modifications in the uh, appearance of the building, the, the the structure of the building without the consent, advice and consent of the property and or standing committee, always a standing committee, but the property committee will weigh in on numerous uh, modifications as well um, as any um, capital improvements to the property. So um, they do need to follow diocesan canons in that regard. The vestry shall present a 
complete statement of the financial condition of the parish to each annual parish meeting. Uh, it also needs to be said that it is responsibility of the, the vestry to arrange for an audit of the parish's finances every year, no later than September 1st for the previous year. Um, the diocese uses a kind of checklist, um, uh, checklist of procedures, which is much less than a formal CPA audit, but which does provide some checks in, on the normal functioning of the of the parish finances. This is critical. Um, congregations need to know where the finances are. Um, congregations need to know how the, the things are being handled appropriately and exactly how much money there is and where it is. Rectors have uh, a need to know these things. There should be a presentation made to every vestry meeting of where the finances are, even if you only do a complete um, report on a quarterly basis. Vestry needs to know from month to month that everything is going well. And it is uh, the responsibility of the vestry to make sure that the treasurer, who will be a confirmed member of the parish in all cases, uh, knows that he or she is required to be able to present those books at any time to the rector and the vestry. That's a canonical uh, matter. Um, the vestry will make arrangements for the support of the rector, the salary, and the event of death to remove uh, or removal to notify the bishop without delay and to supply the rector's place as soon as possible. Uh, and then the vestry shall be responsible for such other duties as enumerated in Canon 26. It is interesting to note that the vestry um, does elect delegates to convention. Many, many annual meetings do do that, but it is under the constitution of our diocese that it is the vestries who do this. And of course, this will be coming up this year for the electing convention and for the annual convention in, in October. So please know that it is the vestry who does that. Now, just um, a couple of things to say about how the vestry is organized. The vestry in Iowa elects junior and senior warden, a clerk from their own members. Um, they, the, both the vestry and both the senior warden the junior warden and the clerk are elected from the members of the vestry. The treasurer is also elected by the vestry, but does not need to be a member of the vestry, although he or she can be. Um, and it is certainly possible to have a, a bookkeeper or someone who does the actual finances who is not the treasurer, but you will still have a treasurer who is ultimately responsible for the presentation of these documents and for the arrangement for um, for submitting for audit. Um, it's very good to make sure that the congregation knows on a month to month basis what the finances are as well. To be as open as possible about the finances of the church encourages stewardship. If congregations know what's going on, it's a whole lot easier to buy into supporting the church when you see how it is being handled. And so between vestry meetings, it's very good for the, the vestry to make available uh, a financial report, at least uh, a thumbnail financial report and a thumbnail summary of the actions of the vestry from meeting to meeting, even though it's probably not proper to, to produce the vestry minutes until after they have been approved by the following meeting. How often do vestries meet? There's no specific provision. Many vestries meet monthly. Some vestries meet mostly monthly, except maybe they'll uh, collapse a meeting into right around the holidays at the end of the year. And uh, then again at um, in the summer, maybe a, a one meeting in July and August. Um, but um, I think other things that need to be known, um, the rector is in, in charge, in very much in charge of the use of the building. Uh, the vestry, the, the rector can decide who gets to use the building on what terms. Um, certainly 
any good rector will be seeking the support and the understanding of the vestry and why those decisions are being made and will be amenable to suggestions from the vestry or to listen to the concerns of the vestry about that. But ultimately it is the rector's responsibility. The rector also has control of the worship life of the church. He or she may designate that to, um, to uh, a minister of music or other people, a liturgy committee who may work with her or him to do that. But ultimately the rector's choices are, are um, that, that they're the choices. Vestries are structured um, to be the heavy lifters in a lot of ways, but a structure that encourages other people to be involved in the ministry and looks for the people to serve with the vestry to, to make the program happen are always, um, always important. Um, I saw some questions from my fellow panelists here, so I, and I didn't get a chance to read them, so I will see what, ask them to just raise them at this point. Mute, unmute. A few things have come in the chat um, as you were talking, um, and uh, that I think people have, have raised. Uh, um, you're talking about vestry meetings. Can we meet without the rector? Can we just have uh, oh. side, side talks, uh, especially no. if we don't, uh, if we've got to talk about sensitive things? Actually, you can't, you can't meet without the rector knowing. You can't have a secret meeting. Um, and you can meet with the rector without the rector with his or her permission. Um, and you can, um, but you do need to have the rector, you can't just have a secret meeting. Are there rules think, about that? Yes, there are, but I'm not sure where you are. <laughs> There, there, um, there. Are maybe the next, next go around. Yeah, um, of the vestry meetings. Upon written request of the bishop, uh, let's see. Special meetings of the vestry. This is Canon Twenty Seven. May be called by the rector and shall be called at the written request of three members of the vestry, including one of the wardens. Notice of spe such special meetings shall be mailed to the members of the vestry not later than 24 hours prior to the hour fixed for the meeting. Um, upon written request of the bishop, the rector or the wardens, if there be no rector, shall call a meeting of the vestry for conference with the bishop. A vestry meeting may be held at any time without notice, the rector consenting, provided every member of the vestry shall be present. Um, there shall be no meeting of the vestry unless the rector, if there be one, and a majority of the vestry be present, provided if the rector be absent for more than four calendar months, uh, the vestry can be competent to transact business. Uh, in no event shall any member of the vestry cast more than one vote on the same question. Um, and then the, that Canon 27 also states that the rector or a designee of the rector if there be no rector, shall preside at all the meetings of the vestry. And I've often chosen if the rector is, if the warden is up for it, to let the warden, to designate the warden to chair the meetings so that I can be the person who kind of keeps the temperature of the room, makes sure that people who want to talk are getting an opportunity to talk. Mm -hmm. uh, and then being able to kind of help them process later what, what's been done. And so I find it a useful role to play. Um, but I don't do that if the warden is not comfortable chairing the meeting. And I also kind of have to sit on my hands sometime so that I don't interrupt. And can, there... the, can the vestry fire the rector? Not the rector really. Quit? The rector needs to resign to the vestry and have them vote to accept that resignation unless she or he turns 72. So, okay. And can the vestry fire the rector? No. Well, it can the bishop then? Uh, not without a lot of work. It's a very long process. And if you get to the point where that becomes an issue, um, probably seek outside help. So Sooner or rather. Bishop just that's went, it's not the bishop's job then to move in and get rid of a right. feisty that's, rector. That's right. It is not. Okay. I think it's, if I can jump in, the, the, uh, there, it is a long process, but, it, but the, as I read the canon, 
uh, and the canons, it, what it encourages is a process of efforts at conciliation right. and resolution of differences. Right. And, and then ultimately, you hope it doesn't come to this, but then ultimately perhaps a determination that those differences can't be resolved. Uh, uh, but then ultimately, and then even, even then, that, that kind of falls, I think, in the bishop's lap about how to ultimately right. have that resolved. But it's a, it's a long, but I think useful process when, it, when it's necessary. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why I emphasized in going through the duties of the vestry that the wardens um, are encouraged to go, to be a voice to the clergy, to the rector or priest in charge, about any matters that come to their attention that need to be addressed sooner rather than later. So that if, they're, if they become aware of an issue uh, with the rector um, or about the ministry that's going on, the sooner they are, they take it upon themselves to raise that issue, um, the better. Um, I was in a situation where uh, because of uh, work years ago, I, I was taking a lot of time out of the parish to work for the diocese and that did become an issue. And um, they came to me and said, how do we address this with people who wonder where you are? And I explained, and um, I don't know that it, it didn't really damp all the anxiety, but at least people knew I wasn't just taking a vacation that I was working. And um, so it, the sooner those questions are raised, the, more, the easier it is to resolve the differences before they get to that point. So the, the vestry's responsibility and the warden's responsibility to, to jump onto an issue as soon as they're aware of it is really critical. The other side of that, I think, is that it's easy for vestry members to get triangulated between people who have a beef with the rector and don't want to address it. And so you will get somebody say, well, so-and-so, I have a person who came to me because they're upset. And so vestry members need to be really careful not to promise anonymity too easily because you can side, you can blindside a rector with a complaint that they don't know where it came from. And if they knew the context, they might know number one who, you know, that somebody is really upset or hurt that they didn't know they'd hurt. Or two, they know the context of the complaint and can put it into the right perspective. So it's really easy for that to happen. I think vestry members need to say, yes, I'll be glad to to raise that issue, but I don't want to be in a position where I can't say where it came from. Um, so it's good to be a, a way people can get their concerns to the vestry, but um, and to the rector, but but use some discretion about how you use that. Um, um, there was something else I was going to say about that, and it just went right out of my head here. I do want to highlight a couple of resources that really vestries should have at their disposal. The Episcopal Church Foundation, which is at www.episcopalchurchfoundation.org, um, provides a wealth of resources. For the vestry handbook ought to be something that a, a church would invest in for vestry members. They can be passed on to new vestry members, but there are just so many things in there that, um, that I haven't been able to cover that the canons don't really cover, best practices, things like that, that are really um, good, good resource tools. And then they have, um, what do they call them? Um, vital practice, ECF vital practices. And you can get into the list to their, their um, um, mailings of things that they send out monthly kind of updates. There's a vestry, uh, stewardship guide uh, and a number of other practices, uh, another, uh, a number of other um, publications and resources that all vestries should know about and have access to. Uh, it just makes like lots of things much easier. Um, was there anything else? Have you come across um, the senior warden being called the rector's warden? Oh. Yes, in some dioceses, that's true. Uh, there, there canons allow for uh, the senior warden to be um, chosen by the rector, and in some cases, not even not even from the elected vestry. Um, and then the junior warden would be elected by the vestry. Iowa canons do not allow that. 
They don't permit that. Um, in some cases, perhaps the, the senior warden might become the confidant of the vestry and the junior warden might be the one who takes responsibility for making sure that the rest of the vestry is, is um, communicated with on a regular basis. And also, um, I think the more unusual uh, designation of wardens in Iowa, and again, this is more practice than it is canonical, is that the junior warden becomes the one who does a lot of the maintenance work, oversees the maintenance of the, of the, the building itself, whereas the senior warden might cooperate more with the program. Uh, but none of that's actually canonical. Um, it's just the way some parishes have traditionally divided it up. Um, but Iowa canons do not allow for the separation of the rectors and people's wardens. So it may happen informally and from time to time will, but I can imagine its circumstances because I've lived in them where the senior warden would be not my first choice of a, of a confidant. So it varies from time to time. Um, what about uh, those that are, you know, quite sure that the church is a business and the vestry uh, is about the business, uh, the business well, practices of the, of the organization? It's difficult because That's there are things churches do need to do in a business-like way. Yeah, professional. All the rest of it, 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 you know, you do want to have some sense of that in a in a business-like way, but we're not a business. And uh, to encourage, and I think this is, goes back to the use of the um, the vestry retreats to build a sense of that over time of what we really are instead of being a business. Yeah, and we do have to make some business-like decisions uh, about how money is used and invested. But for example, people make different decisions about the ethical use of money all the time. And, and investors need to take the ethical questions as seriously as they do the dollars and cents questions when it comes to money. Uh, so I, I think you end up spending a lot of time needing to do some serious thinking about what the call of vestry is. Um, it's one thing to be, you know, what is it, wise as serpents and gentle as doves might be a good description of that dichotomy for vestries. I don't know. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you. Um, uh, uh, do you have more to say or? Just gonna... quickly, um, if the diocese, I think Bill's gonna say more about this. If the vestry, if the parish is incorporated, um, then they will have a registered agent. Um, if you don't know who your registered agent is, it's important to find out because they're responsible for filing a, a two year, every other year report with the state secretary of state and uh, the deadline is April 1st. So it's a good thing to be checking into. So mm -hmm. just, so I think that's me for now. Thank you. As we go on to Bill, uh, Bill, it seems to me if I remember rightly, I mean, I certainly know it as Bishop uh, with the board and the cooperation of the diocese. Um, there are some forms that I fill out in which I sign as president of the corporation. And I think the same thing is similar then, isn't it? With a, with a parish, if I remember in, as a parish priest, a rector, um, when I was dealing with the state, um, I, I signed that form, uh, I do believe. And, and as, as sort of, there's something just signing as president uh, of, of a sort of, uh, of a corporate body. Um, I don't know if that's the same, that, that's how it is with incorporation, um, but uh, I, I have a vague, vague memory, a faint memory of, of that. I certainly know I do it as bishop for the corporation, but a faint memory of doing something similar like that uh, for the, as, a, as a rector. So, um, yeah. And then the other question that, that I, I have just from the vestry thing is whether they're, which you might want to touch on as you go on, um, about their legal liabilities. Ah, that came up the other, yeah. I'll uh, hand over to you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you both. Uh, uh, I'm Bill Graham. I'm the uh, chancellor of the diocese. Uh, that uh, 
that term in, in, in this context and in the context of the Episcopal, of an Episcopal diocese uh, means uh, that I am the, primarily I'm the lawyer for the bishop. Uh, so I provide uh, legal advice and counsel to the bishop and the bishop's office as needed. And then under the bishop's direction, sometimes uh, to the board of the, of the Episcopal diocese as, and sometimes to the standing committee and sometimes to various other committees of the diocese. I am, uh, and the chancellor, uh, however, is a resource uh, very often for congregations and for vestries, uh, typically for the vestry or for the rector. Uh, not as, it would be rare for the chancellor to be, actually serve as the lawyer in any matter for a congregation or a vestry or the rector. Uh, I, I don't believe I ever have. Um, um, so that would be quite rare, but the, the chancellor can serve as a resource on a variety of matters that can come up, particularly those that relate to either the interplay between the diocese and the, and the vestry or the congregation or the rector uh, uh, or canon law uh, or property matters. Uh, all of which are matters that the diocese has a strong interest in and the national church has a strong interest in seeing that, that uh, vestries and, and congregations and rectors um, are attentive to. And, and so uh, like others in the diocese, the, chancellor's, the chancellor can be a resource for that. Uh, I, on, on lots of matters though, that will come up uh, maybe not over the course of a year, but certainly over the course of, of a period of years, uh, it would be useful for you all uh, as a vestry to, to have identified somebody who can serve as, as the lawyer typically in transactional matters, preparing uh, a review and contract, service contracts, those sorts of things. Um, and then uh, and we'll touch on property matters in a bit. Um, so that if you, can, if you can identify somebody or sometimes even in cooperation with nearby congregations, uh, uh, talk, to, talk to a local lawyer who might be willing to assist you from time to time as you need, as you need it. Um, the, uh, I wanna, turn to the, the two particular questions that the bishop identified. Uh, uh, first of all, the corporate context. Uh, your congregation probably, uh, it, it probably happened at a time when it's referred to as a parish, which is a term a lot of us still use. Uh, it's probably organized as a corporation under Iowa law. It may not be though, uh, particularly uh, uh, mission, uh, mission congregations that have simply were transitioned into full congregational status, just uh, kind of as part of renaming. But because of the origins of mission congregations, they often were not incorporated. Um, and so for that reason, yours might not be, uh, or maybe there just never happened. I would recommend that uh, uh, any, that you find out, first of all, whether your, whether your congregation is set up as a corporation under state law, and if it isn't, I recommend that, that, that you do so. Uh, um, that, uh, that will require the assistance, assistance of a lawyer. Uh, the chancellor, I can, I can provide some guidance in that area and I can provide some guidance to any lawyer that you would select because there probably is some language that you might want to use in the corporate documents that would be useful in uh, reiterating your commitment to comply with diocesan rules and regulations and, and national church rules and regulations, the canons. Uh, the, if, you're in one, if you are or once you are incorporated as an Iowa corporation, you will have officers. And, and uh, what the bishop was referring to is the fact that uh, uh, the, although Iowa law doesn't require it, I think the canons expected that the, that the rector uh, ordinarily would be the president of that corporation. Um, and, and that's the main, that's really the main office holder that, that you would need in addition to a secretary of the corporation. And that person uh, uh, would, not, would not necessarily have to be a, uh, a member of the vestry, uh, but I think it would be useful if they were. And if they aren't, then there will need to be some coordination very often uh, specific to that person so that uh, they can get involved in, uh, knowledgeably about the business, even if they're not in the vestry. The secretary 
in Iowa, under Iowa law, a, cor a corporate secretary sometimes has to sign documents along with the president of the corporation. Um, with respect to liability issues, oh, let me back up. Also, the other thing that's useful, uh, two things really, corporate status uh, will, will probably require you all to come up with a set of bylaws for how the corporation functions. Those can be useful. They need to line up well with the canons and they need to line up well with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the constitution of the, of the diocese and of the national church, but they can provide useful, useful guidelines about how to conduct business uh, over time and, and can even provide uh, uh, requirements and guidelines for how the, how the vestry will conduct business in certain matters. Um, the, the diocese itself is a corporation, as the bishop mentioned, and it has its own set of bylaws, uh, which uh, generally, sometimes we have to modify them, but they generally line up well with the canons of, of the diocese. The other thing that, and other thing that's a significant thing that the that incorporation accomplishes for a congregation is it creates limited, uh, a limitation on liability that, that conceivably could otherwise exist. Um, so that uh, if, if, if we are incorporated, then, then there isn't some, there isn't really a very available argument at all to somebody who would want to claim that a member of the congregation had direct liability for the contracts uh, or undertakings of the congregation. Instead, it would be the corporate entity that had those liabilities. Um, the question, and that's the reason that, frankly, that there's one of the two reasons that most businesses incorporate. One is limitation of liability and the other has to do with the ability to sell shares, which of course is not part of the, of the nonprofit world ordinarily and certainly not part of the, of the church world. Um, that kind of dovetails with the question about uh, your exposure as vestry people to liability for the things that you do or are involved with. Uh, that's, that's a question that often comes up and it's a legitimate uh, question, certainly, it, it should not be a concern for you. Um, so, uh, so long as you are not uh, straying way outside what anybody would think would be the reasonable job of a person on a vestry, um, uh, in my judgment in Iowa, you are not going to be liable for any, for any decision that you make. Probably more importantly, insurance exists through the diocese and through the church insurance company. Um, that will protect you and should protect you um, in the event of a lawsuit. It would be uh, extremely rare uh, for anybody even, ever, I think, to assert uh, a, a personal liability on the part of a, of a pestry person. If it happens, generally, you're going to be protected. Um, and certainly, if you have specific questions about that, uh, feel free to contact me, and I, I'd, be, I'd be very happy to talk further with you about that and get you more concrete information about that. Um, the, I, I've, I've, I've said that the, the chancellor uh, would very, probably never serve as the lawyer for uh, your group or for your congregation, uh, but the areas where the chancellor's office can be helpful and I can be helpful, um, are, are, there's a variety of them. One is in, in, the, property, in the question of property matters. Uh, Kathleen, uh, said quite correctly that uh, uh, a vestry can't uh, and a congregation can't dispose of church real estate um, uh, or, or take out a mortgage on church real estate, create liens on church real estate, uh, or make major changes to it without uh, the permission of both the bishop and the standing committee. Uh, that also involves, that, that also would in include leases. So. Uh, and that's where it comes uh, has come up fairly often recently. Uh, uh, you may wish to uh, enter into a lease with some outside entity, typically uh, you know another nonprofit that, that whose, whose mission is perceived as aligned with the church. So it's there for good reasons, uh, and they can be of course a source of funds uh, to help support the congregation. But those leases should be should be entered into only only after. Uh, seeking and obtaining the approval of the, of the bishop uh, and the standing committee. Uh, I, I, as chancellor, I get involved in that and can advise about whether, uh, I'll advise the bishop uh, uh, what I think of the lease and whether, whether it looks good, but I can also 
uh, help coordinate uh, some of that. I've been involved in a couple of situations where I've been asked to actually have contact with the the outside party who wants to lease property, and I, I and I can I I can do that uh, again, not as the congregation's lawyer, but as a representative of the diocese. Uh, the uh, uh, the safeguarding policies for both uh, young people and adults that, that are uh, have been in place in, in this diocese and, and elsewhere for a long time and are being re, uh, renewed and reinvigorated and revised now are another area where sometimes the chancellor can be can provide some guidance uh, to, to congregations as you all are asked to uh, adopt similar policies, which you uh, will be asked to do. Um, the uh, in other and we, we talked about or Kathleen talked and the bishop talked about um, issues that can come up between vestries and um, and the rector. Uh, those uh, generally will will implicate canon law and, and the canons, uh, and so the bishop's office is particularly uh, it's, it's it's very important to be in touch with the bishop. If you get into those kinds of quagmires, just uh, to be sure that you're following the right procedures and getting the right guidance. Uh, I'm not suggesting that the bishop himself or herself will always get uh, even directly involved in advising about that, but I think touching base with that office, I think very often uh, that might be referred to me to provide some guidance on procedures, not, however, to uh, to get involved in the controversy itself. I. Uh, I was involved uh, many years ago uh, when I was uh, on a vestry in, uh, in an issue that came up that uh, uh, the, the vestry just wasn't, uh, we just weren't certain exactly how to, how to procedurally, how to raise the question that had come up. And I found that the, uh, uh, the chancellor uh, who was in, in, in office back at that time was very helpful, not, not in giving any judgment about, about uh, the ultimate resolution, but rather in providing guidance about how to go about addressing the issues and what the canons required in that regard. And also, in fact, uh, the kind, kind of guidance about what the bishop might expect to see in terms of procedures that would be, would be followed. So uh, the chancellor can, be, can try to be very helpful in, 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 those, uh, in those areas as well. Um, on that same general topic, I guess, uh, or related to it is the question of clergy discipline, which of course we hope you would never uh, end up uh, having to be involved with, but those, those things come up, unfortunately, from time to time. Uh, they're rare in Iowa, uh, but they do come up. Uh, that, uh, and lawyers get involved, and church lawyers get involved in that. In fact, there's somebody called the church lawyer. Uh, and that is not that is not me. That is not the chancellor. The chancellor's role uh, in in disciplinary matters for clergy is is very limited, and, and it's limited to providing uh, advice as requested uh, to the bishop, or sometimes just brainstorming with with the bishop about those things, uh, but very much behind the scenes and not as part of uh, the chancellor, not as part of any actor or decision maker in those matters. So. Again, that's an area where if you had questions, uh, I'd be happy to try to elucidate what I know about procedures, but I would never get involved um, in any such controversy itself. Um, we've talked, both well, Kathleen and I and, and, uh, and, and the Bishop have, have talked about canons and, and uh, constitutions. I, I encourage you all to take the time to read the canons and the constitutions of both the national church and our diocese. Uh, they are, uh, uh, some of it's a little dry, of course, but, uh, but, they're, in, but they're interesting. And, I, and it's just good, good grounding, I think, and background for you all. I think a knowledge of, of, of those documents and an, and an understanding of, of uh, the, the bylaws of your, of your corporation, if you're incorporated, uh, are important as much as anything to uh, streamline and and uh, otherwise assist you in moving through the business side of what you're doing 
efficiently so that you so that you don't get hung up any more than necessary in those areas and can instead be spending as much of your time as possible uh, working on the on the ministry side of things and assisting your rector and in and in, and in leading your congregations and on the uh, the spiritual uh, side of, uh, of of what you're doing because that that is what is important. Uh, I think the, the bishop asked you a really good question of Kathleen. She gave a great answer about whether uh, about how to approach. You, you'll hear people say, "Well, we got to run this like a business," and and uh, you know I think the answer to that is no, you shouldn't. You you need to, you need to comply with certain requirements that you have because your business ent entities, and, and as Kathleen said, you need to, on financial matters, of course, you need to be uh, business-like. Uh, one, one of the most sage pieces of advice I, I've gotten in my, in my years in this church was one of my first responsibilities of any kind was on the property committee of, of, uh, of my church, and, and I, I unexpectedly became the chair of that, of that committee soon after I got on it. I think it was because I missed a meeting, uh, but, 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 but at any rate, I became, I became the chair and uh, we had a kind of a controversial issue come up uh, fairly soon after that happened uh, at the committee. And, and one of the older members of the parish uh, who had also at one time served as chair of the property committee for many years, uh, listened for quite a while. He listened to how I was suggesting things be done. And, and he said, you know, Bill, one thing you need to keep in mind is this is not a business and we aren't, and you aren't going to be always making decisions as though you would if it were a business. And that was, that was just good advice. Uh, it's, it's good to remember that that's not, that's not what we're about. We're not in it to make a profit and we're not in it uh, on any sort of zero sum basis. This is a uh, entirely different sort of undertaking and a, and a, and a lot more uh, uh, valuable one in, in, in probably all ways. Um, I'm looking at my notes to see if I have, uh, uh, there, are, there are other, just to, if you have curiosity about, there are other roles the chancellor has uh, that, that just get specifically assigned either by the bishop or by canon. Uh, for instance, the, can, the chancellor serves as an ex officio member of the board of directors and as a member of the executive committee of the board of directors. Um, it, in the context of this pandemic, I've served also on the regathering committee that the bishop put together. Um, and um, uh, I, oh, I have a, 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 a pleasant but very limited role even in the bishop search process where I, uh, I'm the person who conducts interviews of the semifinalists uh, uh, on various things. And that's a, a, a very satisfying thing to do to meet, to meet those folks as we go through that process now. Um, I don't know if there are other questions, but I think, I think, I hope that I have uh, told you a little bit about my role and, and, uh, uh, and what the chancellor's office can and can't do for uh, congregations and, and vestries. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, uh, episodes that occurred in my parish where we used to have, uh, we had, well, we had for over, it went on for over 25 years, um, uh, a meal on a Wednesday night for the community in which a lot of the people that were without homes and people that were living in poverty would come. And uh, it, it, uh, it was a wonderful gift to the community and a gift to the parish to, to, to put it on. But there was also uh, some concern that we were attracting the wrong sorts. And uh, at one point, a member of Vestry uh, actually got to a point where she made a motion um, that this parish dissuades the homeless from attending its functions. And that was the uh, resolution. And I, I asked if anybody would second it. And the senior warden said, well, yeah, I'll second it just for conversation. Well, so it was on the, it was, there it was to be discussed. and. And we went around the room and discussed it, and and and, and I, I said, well, you know, I think um, I think we need to listen also to the parish about this. So we we, we pushed it down the road for three, three months, and uh, not the next semester meeting, but the next semester meeting after that, I said, well, we'll bring it back then. So we, I suppose we 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 pushed it forward to then, 
to be picked up again. And in the meantime, everybody at the vestry was invited to, to have this conversation about this topic with members of the church. That's not a very business-like way of doing anything. Um, but I picked it up from my time when I was a seminarian, you know, in All Angels in New York. I'd seen them do something very similar with a, with a controversial issue that had come up. They kind of gave it some time, they gave it some thought, they gave it some conversation, and they gave it some, gave it you know, to the spirit to, to work among us. So when we got back the next time, you know, we went around the room, everybody spoke, which I think is also a good thing, as, as Kathleen was saying, to have everybody give, give, give people a time to you know, go around the room, don't just sort of wait for those that talk to talk, but invite those that have not talked to share their thoughts. And many people come with great wisdom when they're given that chance. And so we went around the room and, and everybody, I, I first of all said, do you want this still to be kind of moved on? So it was still moved and then seconded. So there it was, it was brought back on the table and we went around and everybody had not just their opinions, but they were able to share where the parish was regarding this ministry. And I was grateful to say that we were pretty convinced to a person, except one, that this was you know, God's work among us. And so, um, and then we voted and we voted it down, you know, uh, one person for it and an eight person uh, against it. So, it, it, it's, it's so you do function differently. I mean, we're doing different work and sometimes one has to let that happen. I, I, I kind of, sometimes I hear congregations say things like, and this more is a treasurer thing, but they have stewardship thing that, you know, a treasurer will say, we've got till August, 2024, before we have to close our doors. And, and that's a, that, that's, that may be actually true, um, but it doesn't allow for all kinds of things that happen in the life of a community of faith. And I, I just don't think that's a very helpful approach to, to, um, to the life of the community. Uh, it, maybe it, if you're going to make that and everybody's going to back that kind of approach up, maybe you should stop right there and then mm. and just sort of cut your losses. And let the money go to the diocese and the building go to the diocese and we can start new ministry in a different yeah. new way yeah and uh but uh and i say that knowing that this is a community of across the diocese where so so many places have so few people who are doing wonderfully faithful jobs of serving mm -hmm. god i was always struck from the very beginning when i first came how small congregations are doing remarkable service to the community, not just as a community, as a church, but also in the personal mm -hmm. commitment of individuals to various actions and service opportunities within their community. And so that is, you know, we're in that kind of, you know, we're in that, that we're, that's the world we live in. And it's the church that we're, uh, it's the church that we're serving and, and God's at work with us organically moving to us um, and so on. Yeah, with a little bit more than the business. Anything else, uh, Kathleen, that strikes you at this point? No, thank you for that. Um, I was thinking about, you know, what, what is really necessary. I was, I was talking to someone this morning about one of the dioceses in Canada who had to go bankrupt, basically, because they were paying, uh, they had, basically dealt with come to terms with their history of abuse of the indigenous population in various ways and they went bankrupt and the next day the bishop said we have a book and a cup and a table and a towel and we're back in business mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, in terms of resources we have all the resources there is in one sense um, and if the parish's structure allows us to use those resources in a fullest way imaginable to make to, to support the mission that our people have and that we are called to corporately as and individually then we have what we need and um, I like that 
I just I was reminded, however, that I intended to remind people about delegates to convention, and it is a responsibility of a congregation to send delegates to conventions. Um, really are supposed to be represented there, and failure to do so can have some consequences for the parish. So um, as we look to sending delegates to two this year, one July 31st and one August or October 30th and 31st, um, keep that in mind. It really is a responsibility for congregations to, to send, to be represented there. And we're clear there is the vestry that makes those up. It's the vestry that does this, yes. Yeah. Yes. Not the annual meeting. The annual meeting. Not <laughs> yes. That's, uh, right. Well, let's just finish with this prayer that actually captures what we're called up into by, by God's Spirit. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by the one through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for serving.